Good morning. Hey, it's so good to be with you this morning. Well, I guess we're not actually with you, are we? Uh, Jan and I are on the East Coast this uh, week. We are taking advantage of the fact that many of our missionaries are back in the U.S., and so it gives us an opportunity to go to visit them without traveling all around the world. And so we're visiting with some of our missionaries and uh, some of the folks who support our ministry over there who live on the East Coast. And uh, we'll be back with you next week. And uh, since uh, we're really early in this series that we're doing on the uh, the Chosen Twelve, uh, the Disciples, um, we thought it maybe it was a little early for us to take a break from it. So Jana came up with the idea, and several others uh, seconded the motion, that we would just try recording it. So I got to tell you, this ought to really be an amazing message, because this is like the fifth time that I've given it. Um, every time something goes wrong. So we'll see if we can get it right this time and uh, do the best we can with it. But uh, we are uh, in a series called The Chosen Twelve, and uh, we're talking about the 12 disciples. And last week, we talked about Peter, which, of course, Peter would be the first one you'd talk about, wouldn't it? I mean, he was always the uh, first one to speak up, the first one to take action. He was always listed first in the in the list of the apostles, and the Peter was uh, just, I mean, he was a guy that you couldn't forget, right? And so we talked about him. And uh, I, I love Peter. Uh, I love uh, the fact that he was a do-it guy. I love the fact that he oftentimes stuck his foot in his mouth. I think many of us can relate to that, can't we? And he was rebuked by Jesus, but he was also praised by Jesus and uh, rewarded by the Lord many times. And so uh, we, we learned some things from Peter's life, and we learned some things that needed to change in Peter's life. We saw from the original Fisher fishermen to the fishers of men, we saw five things that needed to change in his life and how we need to develop those character traits in our life as well. So this week, we're going to look at uh, Peter's brother, Andrew. Now, Andrew uh, grew up in Capernaum with Peter. In fact, he lived with Peter and Peter's wife, uh, Peter, Peter's wife, and Peter's mother-in-law all lived in the house with Andrew. And uh, then Andrew, then you, you can just see this guy who grew up in the shadow of his big, boisterous brother. You know, uh, Andrew was more of a quiet guy. He was not um, he was not weak by any means. In fact, his very name means manly or brave. And we're going to see that he really was very brave. Um, but he, he was always under the shadow of his big, boisterous, you know, in your face, a limelight, spotlight brother. And Peter and Andrew fished with two other brothers, James and John. Well, those guys, Jesus gave the name Sons of Thunder. So you think about uh, Andrew here. He's got in the shadow of Peter, his big in-your-face brother, and then his two partners are the Sons of Thunder. And Andrew was kind of a quiet guy. Um, and yet he was, as I said, he was not shy. He just was not in your face. And you've probably seen that when one brother is so whoa over the top or one family member's that way, the other siblings sometimes just have to tone down and uh, be out, quite out of the limelight. But uh, we're going to see some things about Andrew. I, I just really love Andrew because um, in in Scripture, we're only seen, he's only mentioned three times doing something. Now, obviously, he's mentioned in the lists of the apostles, but only three times are we seen doing something. And every one of those times, he's bringing someone to Jesus. And uh, we know that Peter brought people to Jesus. Uh, we think of the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people. Peter gets up, he preaches, uh, gives an invitation, I guess. And uh, 3,000 people are added to the church. And so both Peter and Andrew brought people to Jesus. But Andrew's was not in so um, uh, limelight, spotlight, boisterous, in-your-face kind of a way. But we're going to see how important what Andrew did do, even though it wasn't so in your face, it didn't receive quite the spotlight that what Peter did uh, received. And so we're going to look, uh, if you open in your Bibles to John chapter one, we're going to look at all three instances where we see that Andrew did something and they're all right there in the book of John. And so that's what we'll start off with. Um, and we're going to start with John chapter one. If you grab your Bible, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. I'll be reading John chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 35. So are you with me yet? Here we go, John 1, 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, this is John the Baptist, 
And uh, he's there with two of his disciples. And we find out later that one of those is Andrew. Now, the other one we don't know for sure, but most likely was John, because we know that of the two brothers, James and John, John started off as a, as a disciple of uh, John the Baptist. And between the P brothers Peter and Andrew, Andrew started off as a disciple of John the Baptist. And so we have John and Andrew are with John the Baptist. So the next day, uh, there was again, uh, John was there with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus pass by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, that was a pretty wise choice to make because John himself had said, I'm not the one. I'm coming talking about the one. And so when he pointed out the one that was coming, his disciples, and he encouraged them, in fact, to follow Jesus. And so they did follow Jesus. Uh, then turning around, Jesus saw them following, and he asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Verse 39, come, he replied, and you will see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Now, verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, there he is in the shadow of Simon Peter, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. So I love the fact that he goes immediately to tell his brother we found the Messiah, but he doesn't stop with just telling him. Look at what it says in verse 42. Then he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. So Andrew goes and introduces, takes his brother Peter and introduces him to Jesus, actually brings him to the Lord. And uh, we know the results of that are just multiplied, the amazing impact that his simple step of introducing his brother to Jesus had on the world. It reminds me of another uh, well-known preacher. You've probably heard of Edward Kimball. Well, you probably haven't, actually, because he wasn't a famous preacher. He was actually kind of a quiet and uh, little retired, soft-spoken Sunday school teacher. And one day, Edward Kimball met a 19-year-old, um, brazen, kind of crude, Bible illiterate young man uh, who worked in a shoe store. But God put this young man on Edward's heart, and Edward just knew he needed to go and introduce him to Jesus. And so... Edward kind of screwed up his courage and decides, I'll, I'll catch him at the shoe store. You know, he can't get away from me there. He's working. He can't go anywhere. So Edward goes to the shoe store where this young man works. And as he gets closer and closer, he gets more and more nervous. His heart's pattering. And <clears throat> he's so scared, he walks right past the door. But he knows he needs to go in and talk with this young man. God's put him on his heart. And so he turns around and gets up and he, he just, I'm going to do it as fast as I can. And so he goes into the shoe store and he, he finds Dwight in the back of the store. And, and in, in his own words, he said, I, I used kind of limping words and I talked about the love of God and about Jesus. And, and I gave some kind of a weak appeal. In his own words, this is a weak appeal. And to his amazement, Dwight is interested. And, and Dwight says, I, I would like to know this Jesus. And so Edward leads him to the Lord. And later, Dwight is discipled and goes on, and Dwight later in his life went by the two letters of his first name, D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody, as you know, was a preacher who led tens of thousands of people to the Lord. And in fact, uh, he led C.T. Studd, who was a pioneer missionary to the Lord. And so the, the works of Moody were multiplied through many others, and then he started Moody Bible Institute, which has sent hundreds and perhaps thousands of missionaries and ministers into the world. All that because Edward Kimball, a soft-spoken, quiet Sunday school teacher, took the time and screwed up his courage to go and talk with D.L. Moody and lead him to the Lord. And all that just reminds me of what Andrew did when he took the time to go and introduce Peter, not just uh, talk to Peter, but bring Peter to Jesus. And so that's the first instance where we see that um, the work of Andrew Though quiet, though not as big and outspoken and loud as that of Peter, made a tremendous impact. Now, the second place is in John chapter 6. If you'll turn over just a few pages, we see another amazing 
result of Peter just doing simply something simple, something that he could do. In John chapter 6, we're going to look at beginning in verse 5. It says this, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Do you ever feel like the Lord ever asks you things like, how am I supposed to know, Lord? I, I don't know. You know. Well, Philip answered him, whoa, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one of these to even have just a little bitty bite. But another of his disciples, here it is, Andrew, and here he is again, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew spoke up and he said, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? Well, then we know what happened from there. 5,000 men and who knows how many women and children were fed. What I love about this is when Andrew brought the loaves and fish, Andrew looked and he said he didn't have anything, but he saw a little boy who had five loaves and two fish. But he knew that wasn't going to be enough. And it would have been very easy to just say, well, that's not enough. We're not even going to bother with that. But instead, he took what he had. Well, actually, he didn't even have it. He borrowed it from the little boy. Uh, he took the little boy's lunch. He said, here's five loaves, two fish, and he gave it to Jesus. And then from there, Jesus did the amazing. Jesus did the miracle. And I think about us. How many times do we see a need and we realize, I don't have the resources to meet that need. And so consequently, we maybe just sort of close our eyes or turn the other way, or we just ignore it and do nothing instead of doing what we can do. And that's what Andrew did. He did what he could do, but he brought it and he handed it to Jesus. And then Jesus did the amazing out of that. And what a lesson for us. When we see a need, we may not be able to meet that need. We may not have the full resources to meet that need. But instead of turning away, do what we can do and then trust the Lord to do the amazing and to do a miracle from there. And that's exactly what Andrew did here. And so uh, 5,000 people, well, more than 5,000 people were fed. The name of Jesus was glorified. God was glorified. All because Andrew was willing to take the little bit that he had and give it to the Lord. You know, I've used this example before. It's like in math or in algebra. If you have, a, if you have an equation and you have like 5 times 2, you know what that's going to equal? 10. But if you have 5 times x, there's no way of knowing what that's going to equal because you don't know what X is. God is like that X factor in our lives. I may have five loaves. I may only have two loaves or two fish. But if I take that and I multiply it by putting it in the hands of X, God, you have no idea what the, what the answer is going to be, how much he can do with that. Because five times X, five times X being infinity, because that's God's power. It's limitless. It's infinity. Five times infinity is Infinity. There, there's no number. It's without number. So when we give what we have to God, though it might not be enough in ourselves and our own strength, when we give it to the Lord, there's no telling what he's going to do. We're just the ordinary people, like all these apostles were. We're the ordinary. We give it to an extraordinary God, and then he does extraordinary, immeasurable things with it. So that's the other illustration I love here about what Andrew did. He just took what was available, gave it to the Lord, and saw God multiply it and do outstanding, amazing things. Now, I have one more illustration in the scripture of, uh, of Andrew bringing some people to Jesus. And turn over to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we read sort of a weird story. Um, some people want to be introduced to Jesus. And uh, they go and, and, well, we'll read what happens here. But what's weird is... Jesus response. It's one of those kind of weird responses like, hello, Jesus, did you hear? Did you even hear the question? And that's kind of what happens here. Let's read in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. <clears throat> now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, <clears throat> who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Now, why they came to Philip? Philip is a, is a Greek name, as is Andrew. Andrew is a Greek name. So maybe they came to Philip because he, he, they could tell he was Greek, or who knows why. Maybe he was just on the edge of the crowd. But they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And rather than just taking them to Jesus, 
Philip went to tell Andrew. And then Andrew and Philip, they went in turn to tell Jesus. Now, here's the scenario. Andrew and Philip bring these Greeks, uh, these men. They say, Jesus, um, there are some men here who want to speak to you. And look at Jesus' reply. You'd think he would say, uh, well, yeah, okay, I, I got some time right now. Or um, wait till all the other people leave. Or, hey, could I see them tomorrow at 2 o'clock? You know, you'd think he would have given some response. But what he says is kind of mind-boggling. Okay, Je Jesus, uh, Andrew and Philip, come. There are these people here who want to see you. These Greeks want to see you. These Greeks want to see you. And Jesus replied, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. <clears throat> and so these Greeks come, and Jesus begins talking about his death, about his work being multiplied. If he would die, that it'll be multiplied. And he goes on to talk about losing your life. And, and he says, my heart is troubled, verse 27. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this very reason I came to this hour. And so he says, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it. And the crowd that was there, they heard this sound. Some of them said it was thunder, but others said an angel had spoken to him. All of this happened. And these Greeks are there. They just wanted to talk to Jesus. And he goes into this long thing about him dying. Jesus then said, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And then he says something which I think is the key to why these Greeks coming caused him to launch into this little message here. Yeah, John 12, 32. But when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And so these Greeks, these Gentiles had come. And they may have been converts to Judaism, but they were still Gentile by birth. And he's reminded, this is like he didn't have an alarm clock to go off. He didn't have a thing on his phone to go off and remind him. But he knew that his purpose in coming was not just to bring salvation to the Jewish nation, but to reach all nations. And so now all of a sudden, he said, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to me. But he's seeing now that the Greeks, these group of Greeks are already being drawn to him. And so he realizes that his time is near. And that's why these Greeks coming triggers something within him, knowing that it is time for him to now come to be lifted up and draw all men, because that is already beginning to take effect. All nations are beginning to be drawn to him and to his message. And all of that hap happened because Andrew was willing to bring these these Greeks and present them to Jesus. It produced a, a voice from heaven. It produced some sort of a signal in Jesus that the time had now come. I just think that's amazing. In fact, the other thing is, as I mentioned before, I believe that uh, uh, Andrew is credited with being the first follower of Jesus. We know that, again, the two brothers, James and John, uh, uh, John became a follower of John the Baptist. Uh, Peter and Andrew. Andrew became a follower of John the Baptist, and um, he's the first follower then of Jesus because he leaves John to follow Jesus. But he also is like the first missionary because we see in those three accounts of him bringing people to the Lord, he fulfilled the Great Commission before it had really even been given. That Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to Jerusalem. Well, obviously, it wasn't talking about this, just the city of Jerusalem, but it was saying your own family, your own those close to you, your own city. Jerusalem, and then Judea, the surrounding area, and then Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the first person he brought to Jesus was his own brother, Peter. And so Andrew went to his Jerusalem. And then the second one, they were outside of Jerusalem when this miracle took place, and he brought the little boy, Judea, the surrounding area. And now to the uttermost parts of the earth, he brings these Greeks. And take note again that these men were from Greece, these men, perhaps women too, we're from Greece because we're going to see how that impacts something later in Andrew's life. But he's fulfilled the Great Commission. So not only is he the first Christian, you could say the first follower of Jesus, but he's also the first Christian missionary, the one who has fulfilled the Great Commission by going into all the world. Now, if you're a vexillogist or into vexillology, which, as everybody knows, that's the study of a love for flags, 
Well, no, I didn't know that either. I had to look it up. Uh, I, I figured there had to be a word for people who love to study flags, and sure enough, there is um, a vexillogist. And so if you're a vexillogist, you're going to recognize this flag that you're going to see right now on your screen as being the national flag of Scotland. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because uh, Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. But we don't want to go into all that. What I want to point out is that little X on there, that white X, is called St. Andrew's Cross. Now, why is an X called a cross instead of what we think of a cross as being a cross beam and a little higher up? Uh, why is an X considered St. Andrew's Cross? Well, we're going to find out about that. It has to do with Andrew's future after the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about how Andrew died. And I know when I was a young believer and I would hear people talk about the saints and how this one died or that, I go, where do they get this information? It's not in the Bible. And sure enough, in the Bible, the only uh, apostles that we know how they died was, of course, Judas, who he hung himself and the rope apparently broke and he fell down then and spilled his guts, uh, fell on some craggly rocks, apparently, and horrible, horrible death. But we know how Judas died. And then we know how John, um, I'm sorry, uh, James, uh, the brother of John, uh, Peter, James and John. We know how James died. Both Judas and James, their death is recorded in the book of Acts. But where do we get the information for all the life and the follow up ministry of these other apostles? Well, I didn't want to hide my secret source from you. I want you to know about it. And that's what this book has been doing over my shoulder the whole time. This is Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is kind of a, a fancy uh, edition I got from uh, Voice of the Martyrs. But Fox um, uh, was a, uh, a Protestant historian. And in uh, the 1600s, he wrote down the histories of these martyrs. And uh, it produced Fox's Book of Martyrs, which was released in 1653. And the, the wonderful thing about it being such an old book is... You can get copies of it cheap. I'm sure there's even free available copies on the web. But I used to go to Christian book distributors, or I'm sure you can get them on Amazon too, and buy just little dollar paperbacks so that I could hand them out to people because this is such an amazing, inspiring book. Now, somebody, one person I gave the book to, they said, oh, boy, that book is depressing. All these people dying. I thought, depressing? To me, it's one of the most encouraging, inspiring books there is. I'm just so inspired by the lives of these who face the torturers and face these incredible, painful experiences, but would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They became martyrs, in fact, witnesses, because the Greek word martyr and witness are the same word. In fact, when when Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, you will be my witnesses, what the disciples heard was, you're going to be my martyrs. You say, well, how can those two words, they mean totally different things? Not really when you realize that a martyr is one who is such a faithful witness that they will uh, testify to the truth of their experience and the truth of what they're saying, even by their own death. In other words, even death will not cause me to deny this testimony. And so they witness so uh, fervently and so accurately, and they are so convinced that their witness and their message is true that they will even die for it. And so uh, this is a story of the martyrs, and it starts with uh, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, then goes to James, and then it talks about the, the life of the other apostles and what, according to church tradition and church history, what they did and how they were martyred. And then it follows the disciple of John, Polycarp, and it, it just tells the, the, the amazing story of men and women who were courageous and brave and who who testified to the truth of what they'd experienced and what they'd seen by giving their own life. So I'd encourage you to get a copy of it, but I want to read a little bit from Fox's book. I'm not going to read the whole story of Andrew. It's, it's only a few pages. We don't have a lot. But there's a few paragraphs in there that I want to read that it tells us that he went up to Russia, way far north to Russia, and then he went to, guess where, Greece. Remember, he introduced these Greeks to the Lord. He went to Greece and in a town of Patras, P-A-T-R-A-S, Patras still exists today. You can find it on the map. <clears throat> there he was martyred. And we're going to read what led up to that, just a little bit here, a paragraph or two from Fox's Book of Martyrs. It says that among the converts was a woman named Maximilla, and she was the wife of a high Roman official. And this Roman official was so angry at his wife's conversion that he threatened to crucify Andrew. And Andrew's response was this. He said, hey, if I had feared death on a cross, I would have never preached the majesty 
or the gloriousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when I started preaching this message, I knew it might lead me to the cross. Well, he was arrested. He was tried. They threatened him. That didn't didn't dissuade him. They scourged him. They beat him just like Jesus. So you can imagine uh, this is an older man and he's weakened now and he's bleeding. And then they tortured him. We don't know what tortures he suffered, or, but you can you can count on the fact that it was it was horrible. And yet he remains steadfast. And now he's weakened uh, and he stands before the judge and he's an older man now. And it says that the judge pleaded with Andrew. He didn't want it. He didn't want to put this old man to death. And so it says he pleads with Andrew. He says, please do not cast your life aside. And, and I love Andrew's response to this. Andrew, it says, the old apostle responded with equal passion, pleading and urging the judge, please judge, do not cast your soul aside. Man, don't you love that? So I love this book. It's an amazing book. I'd encourage you to get it and read through it. Unwilling to recant his faith in Christ, Andrew was tied to a cross, but not a cross like we think of a cross. He was tied to an X cross and left there to die. They wanted his death to be slow and painful, so they tied him there and, he, it, and instead of nailing him to it. And that is why the X is called St. Andrew's Cross. And it says that he was on this cross, but uh, when he approached the cross, when he knew what was going to happen, he's weakened already. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's suffered blood loss. You can imagine he's already, and he's, he's an older man. And so he's already frail and he's approaching this cross. And when he sees the cross, uh, the book of uh, Fox, Book of Martyr records some of what he says. But, but I love this part here. He says, as he's approaching the cross, he says, the nearer I come to the cross, the nearer I come to God. And the farther I am from the cross, the farther I remain from God. And, and he's not talking about uh, literally being nailed to a cross, but I believe what he's talking about here to understand it, we need to go to what Paul said about, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And Jesus himself said, if you're going to be my disciples, you must take up your cross and follow me. And I believe that's what Andrew was referring to here. He's not saying that the closer I come to death, uh, physically, the closer I come to the Lord. But he says, the closer I come to the cross, that cross that Jesus spoke of taking up to be his disciple. You see, Christianity, we, we preach it like it's a party. Oh, come and get saved. Come and be a follower of Jesus. It's a party. He'll meet all your needs. Everything's going to go good. It's going to be great. And yet when we get there, we find out it's not a party so much as it's a funeral. And it's our funeral. We're called to die. We're called to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, to live, but not us to live, but Christ to live through us. Again, I say this before, the Christian life is not about Jesus coming in and making our life better. The Christian life is about the end of our life and him filling this body, filling this vessel with the Holy Spirit and living his life through us. Not living our life and making our life better, but our life ending and him living his life through us. And that's what Andrew's talking about. He says, the closer I come to the cross, the closer I come to laying my life down, and letting God live his life through me, the closer I come to God. And the further I am from the cross, the more I'm living my life for myself, what I want, the further I am from my dying, the further I am from God. Now, what a message. I want to daily come closer to the Lord. How do you do that? By daily coming closer to the cross, daily laying down your own desire, your own wishes, your own future, your own uh, dreams and aspirations, and picking up the cross of Christ, picking up the aspirations of the Lord Jesus and letting him live his life through us. And it goes on to say then, Andrew hung for three days on the cross. And here's what he did. Was he on there? Oh, Jesus, deliver me. Father, forgive me. What what did he do on the cross? God, deliver me from this this punishment, this torture. No, while he was on that cross during that time, he taught the people and he continued to proclaim the message of the gospel for three days. I'm sure sometimes they wish they had put him to death right away for three days. And more and more people came to know the Lord over those three days, because again, 
Here was a martyr. Here was a witness. Here was a man who was dying for this message, and yet he would not recant. And yet he said, this message is true, and I'm proving it by the fact that I will not even beg for mercy. I will give my own life, proving the truth of this message. And then on November the 30th, we're not sure. Fox's Book of Martyrs says 70 AD. Some sources say 60 AD. But on November the 30th, we believe that Andrew died. And that's why November the 30th is called St. Andrew's Day. And so what, a, what an example we have from this man who lived his life uh, regularly bringing people to Jesus and right up to the very end, tied on a cross, tied on an X, he's still declaring and still bringing people to Jesus. Wow. May that be an example for us. May that be a challenge to us. Many times we may not have all the resources we need. We may not feel we're the most charismatic or the most gifted or the most courageous person, but we find that God can use even us. If we'll take what we have, present it to the Lord, he will take whatever we have, the little resources we have, he will add his own infinite power to it for his glory, for his honor, and God then will do amazing, wonderful things. Let's just, let's close in prayer. And Lord, I pray this week, as we have opportunities to bring people to you and present you, Lord, that we won't draw back because we feel inadequate or we feel like we don't have all it takes, Lord, but that we will be courageous enough to take the little bit we have, place it in your hands, and then God trust you to do the amazing. We see amazing things happen through Andrew. We see Peter come and, and, and preach and thousands saved, Lord. We see this little boy come and and 5,000 or more than 5,000 are fed. The needs of people are met and God is glorified and Jesus is, is glorified. The name of the Lord is glorified. And, and, and because Andrew brought that little boy and then we see him bringing these Greeks and we see that the something is triggered in you, that the time has come. You know now that all nations are being drawn and that you're going to be lifted up on the cross. And through your being lifted up, you will draw all men, all nations, all people unto yourself, Lord, all because Andrew was faithful to use what he had and do what he could do. God, may we do the same thing. May we do what we can do, no matter how inadequate it may seem, no matter how uh, less than what is needed it may seem, God. May we be faithful to take what you've invested, what you've deposited in us, put it back into your hands and see you accomplish amazing things for the glory and honor of your name, we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, thanks for being here today.